When walking or driving through vegetated areas in the cooler months, you may have come across a leafy blanket of bright green, an infestation of bridal creeper. Hi, I'm Jess from the Adelaide and Mount Lofty Ranges Natural Resources Management Board. We're going to have a close look at a weed of national significance, bridal creeper, and the various methods you can use to control it. Bridal creeper was introduced as a garden variety in the 1850s from South Africa. It wasn't long before it found its way out of the garden and into our landscape. It's now a prevalent weed in bushland and wooded areas of southern Australia. In South Australia, bridal creeper is a declared weed under the Natural Resources Management Act. This means that all people are prohibited from moving or selling bridal creeper. They also have a legal responsibility to control it on their property. Bridal creeper grows from fleshy tubers underground that are densely arranged along a branching rhizome. The tuberous root mat can be up to 10 centimetres thick and can account for up to 90% of the plant's biomass. The leaves are a shiny bright green colour and occur along the length of the twisting wiry stems that grow up to three metres in length. White flowers appear in early spring and green berries ripen to red in late spring. Bridal creeper is mainly spread by fruit eating birds that eat the berries and pass the seeds elsewhere. Foxes and rabbits have also been known to eat bridal creeper berries. Other methods of spread include the dumping of garden waste and the movement of soil including root mass and seeds by water or machinery. Bridal creepers underground root mass can significantly impact on native vegetation by making it hard for native seedlings to establish. On the surface bridal creeper foliage shades and smothers all that grows in its path and if not controlled bridal creeper can compete with native vegetation for sunlight, nutrients and water. There are a number of control methods available. The choice of control methods will depend on a number of factors, including size and density of the infestation, situation, growth stage of the plant, and the landscape. For isolated plants, such as this one, simple grubbing can be effective. It's important to ensure that all underground roots and tubers are removed, as plants can reshoot from fragments left in the soil. It's also preferable to do this before the plant produces flowers or sets seed. This method involves disturbing the soil and therefore may encourage weed seeds to germinate and establish. It's important to get underneath and lever up the root mass. Here we can see the large underground tuberous root mat for, for the small above ground foliage. Once we have removed the root mass, it is important to replace the soil to minimise the risk of reinfestation and weed seedlings from germinating. Where grubbing is physically difficult, it may be possible to cut off the above ground foliage to prevent flowering and seed set. However, this method will not control the underground roots and tubers. It's important to carefully dispose of all removed plant material. This can be achieved by bagging any weed mass and putting it in a black garbage bag and placing it in a warm sunny spot. 
In effect, we're cooking the weeds and making them unviable. Any dried weed material can then be burnt or disposed of by deep burial. Among the chemical alternatives is the wiping method. Herbicide mixture is applied to the tongs of death with an applicator. This method is used in sensitive bushland situations, such as this one, where we have bridal creeper in amongst the Acacia paradoxa. Spot spraying can be used to treat patches of bridal creeper or isolated plants. When applying the herbicide, spray the leaves along the length of the stems. Care must be given when spraying larger infestations, ensuring desirable species such as native vegetation is not sprayed. Adding a marker dye to the spray mixture will help you to see where you have sprayed and where you need to spray. Remember, when handling chemicals, follow the label directions and wear the correct personal protective equipment for the task at hand. Bridal creeper is less of a problem in pasture situations as grazing animals are effective in controlling its growth, which in turn prevents fruit and seed production. There is a less traditional method also available for the control of bridal creeper, and that is in the form of the biological control agents, such as the bridal creeper leaf hopper and rust fungus. These agents can form part of an integrated approach and are useful for release in terrain that is difficult to access or where other methods of control are not suitable. The leaf hopper is an insect around two millimetres long that feeds on the photosynthetic cells of the leaves. Feeding damage appears as white spots on the upper surface of the leaves. This makes the plant use more energy from the tubers, which exhausts the plant over time. Leaf hoppers won't kill bridal creeper, but the plant will continue to grow with less vigor and in the long run, limits flower and fruit production. Large populations of leaf hoppers can totally defoliate plants in a location. The rust fungus obtains nutrients and water from the plant by establishing an intimate contact with living cells. This diversion of nutrients is detrimental to the plant's development, limiting its ability to flower and produce fruit and more tubers. Both agents are present in our region and can be easily spread to unaffected infestations by humans. There are many good examples of effective bridal creeper control within the Adelaide and Mount Lofty Ranges region. Here at Newland Head Conservation Park, an integrated control approach has been used over a number of years. The Friends of Newland Head have been using manual removal, herbicide and biological control agents to control bridal creeper. My name is Ron Taylor. I'm a member of the Friends of New York Conservation Park. The Friends Group was actually formed in 1988. We do a lot of revegetation work. We actually do rehabilit rehabil rehabilitation of erosion areas. Uh, we do uh, recovery work of uh, endangered and rare species. We do mapping and we do uh, plant lists and we keep administration records and, and look after the administration of the group as well. I'm up front talking about bridal creeper. From a Newland Head perspective, we see it as a classical weed threat. This area is a park for the local native animal and bird species. And that creeper was slowly forcing them out. Not all of them, but a large number of them. And that is one of the main reasons why we decided to manage it. 
unless we knew the extent of the creeper and we were able to possibly extrapolate where it might move to with the vectors that we had determined, uh, there wasn't much we could do to manage it. So we set about some mapping. It took us nearly six months. The good thing about it was we found new species in the park and we found parts of the park we never knew existed before. In 1994, we also decided that we'd start some trials. Not many people had tried to kill the creeper, so we didn't know what sort of chemicals could be used. So the, a very intensive program was set up in year 2000 and also in 2001. And the results weren't all that bad, actually. There, there was a severe reduction in the creeper. But what we didn't know was that when we went back to our trial plots, two years after we, the last time we did them, the creeper was coming back at a rate of knots. In other words, it wasn't all that badly affected at all. And we had... So by 2002, the spray program was ended. It was decided there was no point in continuing with that. And we would rest our laurels on the effects of, say, the bridal creeper rust fungus and the leaf hopper. Uh, the leafhoppers a, in a small section of Parsons Beach uh, have been spectacularly successful after an initial period of around three to four years. And today I would consider it to be a nursery area where leafhoppers could be collected for inoculation elsewhere. And the rust fungus on Parsons Beach at the rear of the dunes was absolutely spectacular and has in fact been used over the last 10 years as one of the collection areas for rust fungus for introduction in places through the whole of the Fleurio area. And we're aware that some of the uh, bridal creeper in the areas behind the Waipinga dunes was not largely being affected by either the hopper or the rust fungus. So we decided maybe instead of looking at um, trying to do it by hand and uh, overcoming the problems of difficult access etc we would of bringing a helicopter and use the spore water system which was developed by some people on Kangaroo Island. The first year we did a, a spray project was in two, 2010 and the results of that were really quite encouraging, really quite encouraging. So we have gone back in there and done some further mapping, another 50 hectares and this year we did another spray program with the helicopter and from here on, we'll be doing our monitoring to establish what sort of success we have with that in 2012. In 1999, the Minister of Environment of the day purchased the land required and set up a new coastal reserve. That coastal reserve contains a number of species of national significance, including the nest of the white-bellied seagull, which is now an endangered species. In 1999, the decision was made to dig. In year 2000, we took out 10 bags in the first dig, in the first gully, 10 bags. Today, if we go back to the same gully, come out and are lucky if they can fill a half of one bag. And we can, we all have always considered and still consider that if an infestation is small enough, that the, the best method and most certain way to, to get this creeper out of the way is digging. We know that the rust fungus is the way to go. It doesn't affect native vegetation. It improves the growth of the native vegetation in that the, uh, some of the uh, environmental conditions for our own natives are improved with the drop off of, of the density of the bridal creeper. And we don't want to be going in there with the chemicals like we were before. And just hoping that we're not doing the damage. So I, I dare say that uh, from here on in, it'll be current biological controls, increasing the, uh, the spread of those by hand if necessary, and monitoring of it. And then finally, I think we'll be doing some mapping of it. We'll actually get into mapping the density of the two biological controls to get an understanding of what's actually happening.